that was, from what I understand, the point of no return for the Houston DA to withhold the names of the two other undercover officers who were uh, involved with the construction of the lockboxes. Uh, that was the last chance for them to hold that off, uh, hold those names, uh, keep them private, and dismiss the case. Um, Austin, uh, from what we understand, Austin wanted them to do that. Um, their attorneys uh, spoke to the uh, to the judge um, on the hearing before that and said we'd prefer to keep those names private. They decided to move forward against uh, Austin's wishes, from what we understand. Um, at that at that pretrial. We not only got the names of the two other undercovers, but we also got the emails and whatever communications um, that they had or made about that action, uh, and we believe we got those from uh, the uh, Suspicious Activity Reports, is what the Fusion Center calls them, uh, SARs. Um, so they, from what we understand, some of that information um, is coming directly from our Fusion Center here in Austin, communicating with the Fusion Center in Houston. Um, so we got that information, and we also found out that uh, it was not three, but six uh, undercover officers that were uh, named in those in those communications, but the judge sealed three of those names. She felt that they weren't involved with the case. Yes, she referred to them as backup undercover officers. To what extent, to what exactly that means, it wasn't defined, uh, whether they were just not uh, involved in that activity. But from what she's saying, they weren't involved in that activity, or at least not implicated by those emails. So she sealed those names. Um, and she gave us the rest of everything. From what we understand, what we got is from about December 12th on. So um, that's what we understand. We're only getting information from December 12th on. That's where she was seeing the mention of the devices. After that, I mean, that's that's pretty much it. She's not going to be our judge for the case. She's looked over this uh, case for a, a year now. Uh, she was the one who originally dismissed it, ruling a probable cause, um, and she is retiring. And our next judge will be appointed by Rick Perry. Um, and uh, from what we understand, we'll be going to a pretrial in January and a court setting uh, February 18th. The, I mean, the most interesting thing uh, for me was some of the pictures that came out, and uh, there's that kind of funny picture of one of the officers holding the pipe, <laughs> like it's some sort of lady, or I don't know, right? Like, making love to the pipe. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so that that's certainly interesting, and I think it shows it shows a, a level of cavalierness and callousness towards the, their whole approach. I mean, they they knew this was going to get people into trouble, big trouble, and they're having fun with it. So, CAPD. Uh, how do you how do you feel about all this? What's what's going on? It's been a long road since last December. Yeah, I mean, it's it's certainly a roller coaster in terms of you know at, at points it seemed like it was about to go away, um, and and now it's it's like looking ugly because we have a different a different person's going to be presiding over we don't know how that's going to go i mean in general i, I still don't believe the the story that they're giving us the the da in houston was we, we asked them if they had any communications any information about an undercover officer months months before we uh, got uh, the undercover in in court and uh, they said no we didn't have any information and if that's true then that means that APD did not let HPD know how to safely disarm those pipes. They, um, essentially, the police department, and I don't know if this is illegal, but kind of contributed to a crime in another jurisdiction. I mean, it's different if they if they were like setting things up in their own jurisdiction, but they themselves added a, a very <laughs> a very dramatic element to a crime in a jurisdiction that they don't that's, that's out of their out of their range. So I don't I don't know if there's you know specific police mis police misconduct um, statutes or laws that would prevent them from doing that, but it's it's certainly peculiar because uh, they just kind of provided that and then stepped away. Um, <clears throat> I think there was communication all along. Um, 
but the story that we're getting is that there wasn't, or that they dropped the ball in some kind of way. So we're going to see exactly how they nuance that story. Well, one more question, I guess. Uh, those photos, the rather dramatic photos of the Austin police officer uh, standing with the pipes, why, were those, those were emailed to other activists to say, hey, look what we did? Or what was what were these generated for, just for them to brag to their buddies? That was, a, what I understand, that's official, that was part of the fusion report. Like, that was, that was what they were giving back to their superiors to say, this is what we did. So potentially somebody filed that photo of the officer holding the pipe at that rather uh, significant angle, uh, it, even to the federal government, because Fusion Center has involved the Department of Homeland Security. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's definitely. that's pretty bizarre. Yeah, yeah. I'm a, it must have been maybe like an inside joke for them or something, but it's it's certainly a not extremely professional way to conduct somewhat federal business. I mean, the Fusion Center is federally funded in the DHS. I think it's like running out of uh, its funding at this point, but it's that's how it was set up. So, well, Do you have anything else to add uh, about the situation? I mean, the only other significant thing is, is Eric. I mean, Eric's going to be in jail for a year uh, pretty soon, in a month. In a month, it'll be a year. We have an, we have an attorney for him now in Dallas. Uh, that's an NLG fellow, from what we understand, who's going to occupy Dallas uh, meetings. So he's supposed to be helping him out, but I haven't gotten a report back from either him or Eric um, in about a week. So I don't know what's, what's proceeding with that. But, I mean, his case is, is just as, as complicated as, as what's going on with us. And... Um, it's it's just ter- uh, it's just terrible. I mean, they're they're holding him on uh, for for no reason. Uh, as far as we as far as we know, the charge came from his aunt. His aunt wants nothing to do with it. But the DA is going to move forward with it anyways. Even though they can't win the case, they're still trying to get these uh, violations, probation violation on one charge, um, bond forfeiture from Houston. They're trying to send him to TDC for four years uh, because of a probation violation. So it's it's the this trumped up charge that. Uh, um, was filed just within the statute of limitations that's allowing them to try and work these technicalities and just keep them in jail longer. And he shouldn't be. He's 24 years old. He's an Iraq War veteran, PTSD, gets disability checks, and he just shouldn't be in jail. Yeah. All right, thanks for talking to me. Yeah, yeah. Thank you.